Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Born to Heal podcast. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Dina Cataldo, who is one of my friends and also clients. And today we're going to share her success story of healing breast cancer. So Dina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to get to talk to you about this. I know. I'm so excited to share with my audience because I know so much, but they don't. And you have a really beautiful story and have also the one thing that I want to say is that whenever I do these episodes of a success story, this is not about what I have done in your healing. It's really the work of my clients. Like my clients who are getting these extraordinary results are extraordinary human beings. So Dina is an extraordinary human being who has really done the work to heal herself. So I just want to start by saying that because I think that healing is an internal job and I, I am the guide who kind of comes along your side and walks with you through the journey, but the work really comes from within. So I honor what you have done here, you know, and I want people to know that from the beginning of this episode, that this is really about what you have created. Mm-hmm. So that just made me tear up as you were saying that, because because it it really is something that you know, when you go through something like this, like the people who are listening right now are people who are maybe experiencing something that feels incredibly challenging. When you expressed what you just expressed, it just reminded me of, oh yeah, like I've gone through those things and I've made it to the other side. So I just want to offer for anyone listening that if you feel challenged right now, that this is something that you can do too. Absolutely. I mean, and you're a living example of what is possible. So now they're going to be like, well, what's happened? What's happened? (laughs) Tell us all the things. So, okay, Dina, I would love for you, let's start the story with when you came to me, which I want to say was in April and what was happening at that time. And, you know, what were the circumstances that brought you to work with me? Yeah. So, I mean, if, to be honest, the circumstances that brought me to work with you happened maybe... (laughs) <laughs> when I was 29 years old, I'm 44 now, right? So, I mean, this was my third time earlier this year, it's 2024, where I've been diagnosed with breast cancer. And when I was 29 years old, I was a young trial attorney. I was working a million hours a week and I was diagnosed at 29 years old, which to me seemed crazy. Like 29, I should not have breast cancer. And at that point in time, I recognized that I needed to figure out a better way to live. I started, you know, the way that I knew how without any guidance, slowing things down and figuring out how to be a lawyer and not kill myself, literally. Mm -hmm. And I was doing really well. I made a lot of a lot of changes over the years, but then I was diagnosed again a couple of years ago, but this time my breast cancer had migrated into my right lung. And I had surgery and I had it removed. But you know, when I got it this third time, right? When I was diagnosed with it, I thought this is not the way to handle it. Like I've gone through chemotherapy at 29. I did radiation at 29. They told me, you know, it hasn't gone to the rest of your body because your lymph nodes are clear. And I believed, I believed it. Like, like I heard it and I said, okay, well, you're, you're the people I need to trust. You know what you're doing. So I followed that guidance. I went through those treatments and then I got it again a couple of years ago. And I thought, okay, well, this is something that needs to be handled. I'll have, I'll handle it surgically. It was removed. I didn't do additional treatment, but I kept being monitored. So when I received this diagnosis earlier this year, there was just something that clicked with me that said, this is, this is something I need to handle differently. This is something that there's something else happening. It's not entirely, you know, around stress because I don't have the same stressors. Like there's other things that are happening and they're not being addressed. And I don't know what they are, but I know I need to do something different 
And I talked to one of our mutual friends and they recommended me to you. And then when I connected with you, you really gave me clarity on what I had been through in the past and what I was experiencing in the present and what my options were. And I, I think, you know, as, as well-meaning as the doctors in the, in Western medicine are, they don't necessarily have all of the tools and don't have, have those kinds of things available to them that I was able to receive from you who has both perspectives of someone with that background of Western medicine, but then also understanding that, yeah, there's other things going on besides how it's being, how cancer is being treated in the, the traditional medical practices. Yeah. So, and specifically when this recurrence or this new area in the other breast. So you had had surgery on the left breast initially, correct? Well, Back when you were 29. So here it was left breast in 29, right lung two years ago, and then again in the left breast just earlier this year. Okay. So yeah, I just want to clarify that. So this had come back in the left breast and tell me what the um, conventional doctors had told you were your options so that we can just kind of get to like, okay, what was it that you were dealing with at this, at this point when you came to me? Right. So this, and it, so when I went in to see my doctor who I'd been working with because she'd been monitoring me for, I don't know, 14 years now. And she recommended I get a mastectomy that I have my left breast removed. I do reconstructive surgery. And then that, that was really the only option that she gave me. And I was kind of in shock when I received this, this third discussion, like this third diagnosis, I was just like, I'm doing all the things. Like, why is this happening again? Mm -hmm. And now she uh, mastectomy, but I'm thinking, well, I guess maybe that does make sense because it's, a, it's happening again. And the way she said it is what made it click to me is she said that there's like some, there's some kind of defect. There's something wrong on the left, the left breast. And that's really what made me click. It's like, this has nothing to do with it doesn't have anything to do with what I've thought it was all these years. Like there was some kind, something I wasn't quote unquote doing right. It was, you know, I need to just balance something like this is an imbalance. It just, it just clicked with me that it was an imbalance, but I didn't know what else I could do at that point. All I had was, okay, we should just have it removed. So you came to me at this point and this is the way that I was thinking because I was like, okay, I'm just going to for a minute, I want to think like a traditional Western oncologist to say, does the treatment that they're recommending make sense given the full diagnosis? So given this history of what you've described, it's, you already had stage four disease because it had originated in the left breast. It had spread to the lung a few years ago that had been removed You'd had the lumpectomy, you know, back initially. And then this new area in the breast actually was what they described as DCIS, which is a stage zero. It was thought to be a second breast cancer in the left breast that was non-invasive. So DCIS by definition means it's not going to spread to the lymph nodes. It's not life-threatening. And so in my mind, I was like, if I'm thinking like a Western doctor, why would we recommend a mastectomy for something that is a stage zero breast cancer if in their minds you already had stage four disease? And so this is the very first conversation that we had. Actually, I remember you being so surprised that you were like, oh, wait, right. Like, why do they want to take my breast off if it's stage zero you know, and they already think that it spread, you know, why would they want to take my breast off? So that was the first question is, and this is a lot of the time what I'm doing for people in the initial consultation is just looking at, okay, does this make sense? Does the plan that is being recommended make sense in the context of what the Western medicine thinks? And then we also look at it from like outside that to say, okay, well, outside that, does that make sense? But initially, I want to just even understand where they're coming from. So 
I started to question. I said, I mean, personally, I'm thinking if they think you have stage four disease, why are we going to remove your breast? Which is a very, you know, psychologically um, devastating procedure. Like, why are we going to take your breast off for a stage zero breast cancer? Like, why is that the first option? And that within reconstruction, I just thought it was aggressive for what we were looking at, which was a stage zero new breast cancer. And so that was the first question was just to say, okay, let's start asking your doctors, is this really what needs to happen? And because it's stage zero and you were so interested in changing in doing something different this time in taking an approach that is not what you had done before, which had been to follow the conventional protocols, you know, I said, what do you think about going to your surgeon and just saying, hey, if this is a stage zero breast cancer, I really want to do some aggressive natural healing. Can you give me some time? Can you give me three months to approach this naturally and then reassess to see how the results are so that then we can make a decision. And if it progresses or if it hasn't changed or whatever, then we can regroup just, you know, using their frame of mind um, around the, you know, the approach that they're thinking. So, and I apologize everyone for my dogs. I'm not sure my dogs are having like very active while we're on this call, but anyway, you might hear some barking in the background, but um, anyway, so what happened then after when we had that first conversation, how was it for you then to go back to your doctor and have this conversation? I was very fortunate in the sense that the doctor that I've been working with, she has a bit of an open mind, right? Like I knew that just from prior discussions that we've had about other topics. So I felt like I could bring this to her and lay it out and say, hey, I would like to do this more naturally. And she knew that that's where I was. She knew I was healthy, you know, yoga, all the things. And she recognized that this was something that, you know, I was, I was, I would tend towards in other areas of my life. So it was interesting to hear her thought process out loud because she was thinking out loud about what would make her comfortable moving forward. <laughs> it was really interesting to hear her say, well, if there was a cancer to try this on, it would be this one because it was a non-invasive and that would, that made her feel better. She still wanted to have more tests and that was fine. Like I didn't have a problem with that. And then when we scheduled those, it was after I had done the, my work with you so that we could see what's the before and the after. And that was something that um, she was, it took her a little bit of time to kind of work herself there. I could see another doctor maybe not having that ability, but I, I saw her get herself there and, uh, and be in a position where she could then be on my team and assist me with the screenings, but not feel like she has to jump in with surgery. Yeah. Well, and I think that this is an important topic that we're addressing right now, which is talking to your doctors about giving you potentially time to explore these other options. And, you know, one of the things that you and I spent quite a bit of time talking through on that initial consultation was how do you bring this to your doctor so that they can be open? And also, you know, you had said to me that one of the reasons why you had been with this doctor is because she was quite open. And I think that this is a factor to think about if you want to pursue natural treatments and you do have a conventional oncologist or surgeon or both probably to search around for those people who are open, who will, you know, and, and I love how you said that, that she was, you know, out loud kind of convincing herself. And that's a lot of it actually is when you bring these ideas of buying some time and not jumping into the conventional protocols right away, 
your doctor is going to need a little bit of time to process that and get on board with it and feel comfortable with it, you know, and if they're not, then maybe you need to look for another doctor, right? But fortunately for you, and you also had this relationship with this doctor that you guys had been together for quite a few years. So um, I think that, you know, when you approach your doctor, you want to think about the way they think, and that's why I was like, okay, from their perspective, how can we talk about this? You know, and and what I said to you is I said, you know, from her perspective, it's stage four. And now there's this stage zero. So this is an area that it makes sense that if there's any time that they could give you some, you know, time to explore other options, this is it. And I think that you did such a good job of communicating that to your doctor to bring her along and keep her on the team, you know, while we looked at an alternative to, you know, do more natural healing. So, and I say that that's, that's a skill, you know, and you're obviously skilled at communication as an attorney um, and convincing people, right, of things. So uh, that was definitely a gift that worked in your favor, but I think for people who are listening, it's just like knowing that you don't have to hide all of this from your doctors. You can find a doctor who will be on the team with you as you explore other options. So um, so what I want to talk about now is, you know, with all of my clients, the approach is multifaceted. You know, we're we're Uh, looking at the physical body. How do we detox the physical body? How do we give the physical body the nourishment that it needs that it may not be getting? How do we help clear emotional trauma? How do we help you become more fluid with your emotions? How do we program the subconscious mind? How do we help direct your mind to the outcome that we want? And then spiritually, how do we help ensure that you are aligned with your authentic self. So the work that Dina did with me was over 12 weeks and we addressed all of these areas. So I want to be clear that it's never just one thing. And one of the things that I really appreciate about you, Dina, is that you are so open and so committed that like you were, because this is, it's, it's, you know, Sometimes people will be open, but then they're not really disciplined and committed to doing the work. But you were open, like wide open to exploring the potentials of all these different areas, even though you've done actually a lot of personal development work. You've done a lot of work in these areas. But what we were looking at is like, okay, how can we dig deeper? How can we find the places where maybe there is something that is causing a block that is leading to development of disease in the body. And um, I guess one question that I have for you is when we initially started the work together and you were looking at all these things, and I know you've done so much of the personal development work, what for you was like either an aha, like, oh, wow, you know, this is something new or Or was it like, oh, I've done a lot of these things, but I'm willing to go deeper. I'm kind of wondering what your response was because a lot of people come to me and they're like, look, I've done so much like deep work that I don't think there's anything left to be done. And you would fall into those, that cat, you could easily fall into that category. And I'm wondering what made you so open? What made me so open? Well, I think one of the things that made me so open was my knowledge that there was something else happening that I couldn't explain because I, I am deeply spiritual and I, you know, I know that there are things that I can't explain that occur. And one of them was this recurrence in my body of cancer. And I'm like, I, that's one of the things that made me so open because whenever I see something that I know is going to help me grow. And that's what I really, that's how I look at it, every experience of cancer I've had. And, and that might make me a little different than some people, 
But when I look at it, maybe not the first time, the first time I was freaked out and then it took me a little bit to get on board with after the fact, oh, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. Like I truly believe that, that the cancer I had at 29 was the best thing that ever happened to me. And every time I've had cancer since a diagnosis of it, then I looked at it as this is my opportunity to take myself to the next level. Mm -hmm. Like that's how I look at it. That's my mindset going into it. And I understand that if it's maybe your first experience or even if it's not your first experience having a diagnosis of some sort, that it can be difficult to get yourself there. But if you really look back at the progress you make after the fact, and you really look at, wow, look at the person I am now compared to who I was before, I guarantee that there's going to be a significant difference. But one of the things that you and I worked on that I thought I was doing really good work on, and I was like, yeah, this is great. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm eating healthy. You know, I'm, I'm doing really well. It was my food. I thought I was eating so healthy and I was compared to maybe how I was, you know, even a year ago prior to that. Right. But I didn't have my awareness on so many different aspects of nutrition. And, you know, I've always looked at myself as, as pretty healthy, mm -hmm. but there's so much to nutrition and you had really, you know, you connected me with someone who really simplified it in, in such an easy way. And it made me think totally differently about it. And I could, now I have it as where it's sustainable. I'm not perfect by any sense, <laughs> any sense of the imagination, but it's so much better. Like I can tell that my nutrition's better. I feel better about the food I'm eating. I eat so much cleaner. Um, you know, I, I went through a detox situation that we were talking about, like after, um, I was doing some saunas and it was, it was very clear that like my, my muscles were detoxing things that have accumulated over the years. And my awareness just wasn't on that. I had no clue. I mean, you just don't know what you don't know. And this particular experience allowed me to see so much of those things that I didn't know. And now I can pay attention and I can see, oh, wait a minute. Like, of course, those choices might lead to this particular outcome. <laughs> like, like, let's take a look at those. So that was one thing that, and I don't know if that specifically answered your question, but that was something that was pretty surprising to me that there was just so much, so much of a gap between where I thought I was and where I wanted to be, but I just didn't have the knowledge to get myself there on my own. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, diet is something that is quite complex. And there are so many people out there, especially in the cancer space, that is like, you have to eat this way. This is the one way that we heal cancer. And that is just not true, you know? And so, what I do in my practice is really looking at, okay, there's some basic principles that we, you know, eliminate sugar, we really reduce carbohydrates and start to focus on the quality of the foods that you're eating, making sure you're getting good protein because protein is the building blocks of our body, you know, doing healthy fats, very low carbohydrates, and then checking ketones and glucose. So you just start to get awareness about what your body, how your body is responding to those foods, and then also reducing things like lectins that are inflammatory in the body. But it's very personal, you know, and, and some people would be like, oh, you have to do, if you're going to, you know, reduce carbohydrates, you have to do full ketosis. And I just don't think that that's the case. And we did not do that with you. You were in like a moderate ketosis because you were eliminating the carbohydrates. But I think this is one thing for people to know is that there's not one diet and finding the diet that works for your body. And what's beautiful, and I love that you say that now, is you feel better in your body with doing this work. And that's how it should feel. So if you have been told you have to do a specific diet and you actually don't feel good on it, it's likely that's not what your body needs and we're all unique. So um, I love that you bring that up because you actually were eating quite well. 
Like if you would look at your diet, people would say, oh, well, she's eating great. So why would you change anything there? And it's like, well, I'm like, if cancer is growing in the body, we've got to shift some things. And initially you were like, oh, wow, I don't know. And you're already, you were thin. So you didn't want to lose more weight. And there was kind of this adjustment of like, okay. And what I love about you is you're just like, all right, fine. I'm like, (laughs) you're like, I'm not sure I buy into this, but I'm going to try it. And then you get to see by the data, you know what I'm saying? So when we start collecting data, we start to see that. But you said something in this that I want to circle back to that was beautiful in talking about your initial diagnosis and that it was the greatest gift. And I'm wondering, you know, I this is something that is really hard for a lot of people when they're going through it initially and they're like, screw you with your gift. And, you know, and right? I'm not saying that to you, but, but no, I, I, I get it. You can't in the present moment, this is something that only comes in retrospect, but I'm wondering if you can speak to those people who are like, I know people say that, but like, what does that mean? Like when you say that, what does that mean for you, Dina? So first I just want to speak to, if you're listening to this and you're going through this, like have all the feelings. Like you you don't need to think this is a gift right now. <laughs> you, you just feel the feelings. You do what you need to do right now to take care of yourself. Like that's, that, that's the first thing I want to say because I certainly, when I was first diagnosed at 29, I was upset. I was angry. I was confused. I didn't understand. And I was not in the place, nor would I ever expect myself to be in the place of, oh my goodness, this is such a gift. (laughs) I just would not ever expect that of myself or, or of anyone else. But what got me to the place of looking back in retrospect and seeing it as truly the gift that it was, was that it was the wake up call I needed to make a shift. And at the time, you know, I was a a newer trial attorney. I was working 50 to 70 hours a week. I was, you know, you know, imagine your typical lawyer and like you were a doctor. So you understand, right? You're just, your life is about work. And that's where I was. My entire life was about work. Everything was focused on work. I, I literally went on a date and fell asleep on my date. Like, I, I mean, I mean, it was that kind of thing. Right? <laughs> like it was, <laughs> it was all about work. And that was, that was my life. And when I look back, I can see how, oh, wait a minute. When I got that diagnosis, it opened me up to seeing how there were things I was not doing. I wasn't going to yoga. The first time I went to yoga was after I was diagnosed and I was starting chemo. It was something that I felt called to, and then someone invited me to, and it was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And yoga is something that I just, I have a love for yoga. It just, it makes my body feel amazing. It makes my mind feel amazing. And I wouldn't have been introduced to that if it were not for the pause I needed to take during chemo. I also say chemo seemed like a vacation compared to my trial practice. So when I was in chemo, I was amazed. I didn't know my body could feel so calm. I didn't know I could feel so good because my body was in constant survival mode. I was in fight or flight all of the time. I had adrenaline and all of those things running through my body. And when I had a moment, well, three months I was doing chemo to relax, I was like, this, this shouldn't be happening. Like, why am I so relaxed on chemo? Chemo should be horrible, but I am enjoying this. This is not right. And so I then was in a position to reflect and say, how do I transition my life so that I can be a lawyer but not feel so stressed out? And of course, that led me, you know, years later to becoming a coach for lawyers to help them in those same situations. But that was my life. And unless I had that wake up call, I was just going to continue down that same path. Yeah. Well, and This brings me back to an episode that I just did with Tony Gillardi, who is the author of Breastquake. And she talks about this in her book, how women in specifically this book is about breast cancer, but that women often won't give themselves a break, but the breast cancer diagnosis forces them to stop 
and give their body a break. And it's so, of course, this is not conscious, right? But on a subconscious level, your body, this was the wake up call, like you said, to stop and to, and then I, what I love is that you had the awareness during the chemo to say, wow, wait, why do I feel so relaxed while I'm getting <laughs> chemo? Like, cause some people might just be like, okay, I don't know. And then keep going. But that awareness is what opened the gift. And you're absolutely right. I think that the cancer, and this is actually why I love working with people who have cancer because it is such a big wake up call. And when you, you know, answer the call, that's what I love being part of is that when people can open and then say, okay, something needs to shift. And maybe I don't know what that needs, you know, what it is that needs to shift, but having someone to help me sort through that so that then I can make the changes that I need is just, it's, it's what this is all about. You cannot solve a cancer from the same level from which it was created. And I actually resonate with this whole idea of not taking a break because I remember when I had my first baby, I was a resident. I was just like a first year resident. Yeah, it was my first year of radiation oncology residency. And I was so excited to have a baby because I was going to get a vacation. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what is it? Like, what kind of twisted <laughs> mind do I have that I think that having a baby is some kind of vacation? But like, this is how I was thinking. So I absolutely get that as like a driven professional. It's like we just push and push and push and never give ourselves the permission to take a break. So um, that is so beautiful. And then I love that, how you say, you know, feel all the feelings. And this is one of the things that we worked on too, is being with your feelings. You already had done a lot of work in this area, but teaching you how to allow those emotions to flow through you and not to push them down and to have the experience. Like cancer is traumatic, you know, it trauma can lead to cancer, but cancer, the diagnosis, and especially the way that it's treated in our society can feel traumatic. Um, okay. So I, what I want, we, we did all the things. So I said already that we did all the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, but like we did a lot of detoxification. You talked about saunas. We did supplements for detox. We did emotional detox. You know, there's a lot of pieces to this. And, um, but I want to get into the water fast. So this yes. is a common thing. So, you know, those of my listeners who you've heard Christy's story before, Christy did a 17 day water fast. Dina and I also did, uh, when I say we, I'm like, I didn't do the water <laughs> fast. I was with Dina in the experience of the water fast, but, um, Dina did a 14 day water fast and we chose that length of time just based on your work since you, you know, could, that's how much time you could take off for, um, you basically cannot work during a water fast and then you need refeeding after the fast and you have to take that time off work too. So logistically, actually the logistics of a water fast, I think are one of the hardest pieces to figure out when to do this, how to, you know, carve out that time in your schedule. But I wonder if you can talk through the water fast, like from the, the, when I brought it up, mm -hmm. what were your first thoughts about that? And then to the experience of doing it, I'd love to hear you share about that. Yeah. And I specifically want to speak to the logistics of it because I think that I even, I am a coach. And so I had to coach myself into doing it immediately because even my brain wanted to say, well, maybe I can't do it now. Maybe I should put it off till da, 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 until there's this perfect time. No, you just have to make the decision that this is important to you. You make the space. I moved appointments. My clients were understanding. I didn't have to be like, hey, I'm on a water fast. I just said, hey, I'm unavailable for these next two weeks. You know, just so you know, let's reschedule, right? So, if that gets in your head at all about this, don't let time get in the way of you and your healing. Like you just have to make a decision that this is important to you. So that's what I did. And of course, all the feelings came up because I run a business. And of course, 
you know, if I'm not working, I don't make money. So, so those kinds of feelings came up and I just had to say, look, this is important and I'm committed to this. How do I make this work? And so I just talked myself through it and I put the pieces together. And I know I have that conversation with you, you know, about logistics. And then we just made it happen. And then in terms of what came up for me, not eating, I actually thought this was kind of funny. And I think I shared this with you is like, I thought this was going to be like Buddha on a mountaintop. I was just going to be at peace and it was going to be just so I was just going to feel so quiet and just ah, like, you know, on this fast. That was not what happened at all. And um, yeah, it was actually completely different. <laughs> and that was something that I, I was so happy that you were there to help guide me through that because I did need those little pep talks. <laughs> yeah, well, and also maybe you can talk about this, but one of the things as your body is healing in a water fast, physical pain can come up in the body mm -hmm. because your body is repairing. So do you want to talk about that? Because I remember that was something that was hard for you because you were like, why am I feeling so much pain in my body? And um, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't anticipate this, but I had um, a rough, I think the first, you know, the first couple of days were fine. I think I even was closing up some matters on, on the last day or two, but, or the first day or two of, of the fast. But what I noticed was that by day or night two or three, I couldn't sleep because I was in so much physical pain and I didn't understand it. I was trying to find, I was, couldn't get comfortable. And I, I was, I, talked to you about this and you had explained what was happening in my body and you gave me some suggestions and that worked. But I wasn't anticipating that my muscles were going to be in such pain, like especially my hips and my legs, which makes sense because that's where, you know, my larger muscles were. And um, it was pretty surprising because I, I just, yeah, it was just kind of surprising um, based on my expectations of what it would be. It was surprising. <laughs> well, and I remember this because you were like, um, once you figured out the logistics and actually I love that you said that, that you just got to make it happen. Cause initially we were planning it a little bit further out. And then you were like, you know what, I just need to make this happen. And then we just did it. And it just all kind of happened quickly. And, um, you were like, I'm just going to be like Zen and this is going to be, you know, a spiritual experience. And I'm like, it's going to be a spiritual experience, but I don't know if it's going to be Zen. I was just like, but I don't want to get, you know, maybe your experience is going to be super Zen. It's just not typical, but mm -hmm. so in, in there were periods in there, there are periods in a water fast that can be Zen, but there's definitely discomfort because there are a couple things here. When you do a water fast, <clears throat> not only are you fasting from food, but you're fasting from work, right? So, and you just described you're a very driven, high achieving professional and to put that all away. And the first couple of days you were wrapping up some of your business that had to happen. But then I was like, okay, by day three, you have to be done with all of that. And that was hard, right? There's discomfort from really stepping away from the business and then also content, you know, people think that like, oh, I'll just like watch movies and, you know, do scroll on Instagram. But when you do a water fast for healing, it's really a deprivation of more than just food. It's a deprivation of content. It's really resting so that your body is using that time to heal itself, right? And just physiologically, I want to explain to people what happens is that once you get through the first couple of days and your body switches into ketosis, it goes from using sugar or uh, glucose as fuel to using ketones, it also starts eating your cells. So it starts eating fat cells as fuel and our toxins in our body are stored in the fat. So actually, as you're getting rid of those toxins, they have to flush out of your system through the water and then, you know, through your urine. And that can cause, like Dina was describing, this discomfort, physical discomfort, because 
you are eliminating toxins from your body. And this is one thing that makes me upset because there's a couple of people in the fasting space, doctors, who say fasting shouldn't be uncomfortable. And I'm like, well, if you're doing prolonged water fasting, it is uncomfortable because your body is eliminating toxins and that can cause physical discomfort in the body. And my experience is that it does do that. So, <clears throat> so basically you're eliminating toxins from your fat as you're eating the fat, but then your body starts preferentially eating any diseased cells in the body, which cancer, you know, those cells are not normal. And so your body is going to preferentially eat those cells. This is called autophagy. And this is actually the magic of what's happening with um, a water fast is you're eating the cells that are not healthy in your body preferentially. And so anyway, this is a process that you're, you know, it can cause physical discomfort. It causes mental discomfort because we're used to consuming so much information or doing so many things. And I remember for you, just going outside and sitting in the sun was like an activity, you know? And when I do these, when I supervise these fasts for people, we're in contact every day. So I'm monitoring your ketones, your blood sugar, we're doing weights, we're checking in to see how you're tolerating and, and doing that. And we also check labs before you start to make sure all of your electrolytes and everything are normal. But it's like a complete shift of like just taking a shower is exhausting. Like oftentimes people need help to take a shower and wash their hair. So um, yeah, I I think that this is the thing is just setting the expectation is that this is uncomfortable to go through this process. And I'm wondering if you can speak to just, you know, initially there was that discomfort and the pain, but as it went along, did you lose hunger? Like this is one thing that people are really afraid of is am I going to be hungry for the whole time or or what it what was that like for you with the food? I was pretty fascinated by this because I didn't have cravings. I didn't desire food as if like I, oh my gosh, you got to keep me away from the kitchen. Like it just wasn't anything I wanted. And that was kind of surprising to me. It was just, no, this is just what I'm doing for the next two weeks. Yeah. And I felt really good about it. I think my mom felt bad because she was eating in front of me. And I was like, yeah, I, you know, I actually don't desire any of that. Like, I, I'm fine. And I I felt like the last week, I think it was the last few days because my brain was anticipating the end. That's when it was where it was interesting. Not that I was going to eat anything, but that was when I think I got the A-OK to like look at things on my phone. <laughs> and so I started just scrolling food porn. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I wouldn't even eat any of these things, right? Like it's like sugar. It's like crap food. But it was just fun, you know, watching watching this stuff. And um, and that was really where I was at. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm anticipating what I'm going to eat. I knew exactly. <laughs> this was funny. I remember telling you I knew exactly when I wanted to eat the first day I was going to eat. And then it wasn't available. Like, I didn't have the pasture raised, you know, <laughs> organic eggs that I wanted. And I like, and I cried because <laughs> I was like, I can't eat these. <laughs> so it's just kind of funny. Like the expectations are our mindsets for how things are going to go and we get attached to how they're going to go. And then, and then the emotions that can come up. But that was really around food. That was what came up for me, that's um, so, especially towards the last couple of days. Yeah, that's so funny because I remember that. You'd been like just so resolved and like so just like a rock through the whole thing. And then the day of refeeding, you, you like leave me a message and you're crying. Just like, I can't have the eggs. I can't have the eggs. And I was like, oh, Dina, it's okay. Like I, but I know what that's like, you know, that, that, that refeeding, you're like, just been looking forward to that first meal. And then it was like, I forget what happened with your mom getting the wrong oh, kind of eggs or something. Some new eggs. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but, and also the food porn is consistent. So that's also something that other clients have said where they get kind of obsessed with looking at food, but they're not going to eat it, but it's right. something really fascinating about looking at it. So, <laughs> it's so, so funny. So, and then the refeeding process, just so for people who are listening is like, then when you start eating, you have to go very slow. And I think for you, we had maybe five or six days of refeeding after the 14 days of fasting. And during those days, you also can't be doing, you know, normal activities because you're still quite weak um, as you're kind of coming back online. But okay, so we finished the water fast. And then this is basically towards the end of our 12 weeks together. And your um, mammogram comes up and you're going to go back to see um, and maybe not see the surgeon, but go have the mammogram. So walk us through all of that. It was so interesting. It happened exactly how I thought it was going to happen. Because I had actually imagined this earlier on when we had started working together. I was like, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go to the the place to get the mammogram. And then they're not going to believe it. And so they're going to have to get a close-up image. So I'll have another image. And then they're going to call me back and then they're going to tell me I don't have anything anymore. Like it's gone and they're going to be confused. And that's exactly what happened. So I, I went there the day of and um, that exact process happened. I was called in. They called me in a second time because they needed to get a, a close up image. And then the doctor Different doctor, not a surgeon, just, you know, the person who goes through the mammograms. And apparently these are most visible on mammograms. And that's why it's, we did the mammogram to, for the testing. So we go in and he just says, well, you don't have any calcifications. They're gone. And I said, yeah. And I said, <laughs> and I said, hey, awesome. Give me a high five. Right. So I was like, and they were so confused because I'm sure nobody ever is like, Hey, give me a high five in there. And I'm like, give me a high five. And so, um, he gave me a high five very <laughs> tentatively. And, and, and I, I said, yeah, I, I did a 14 day water fast. I worked with you, you know, and I was saying like, you know what I did. And he was like, he just kind of looked at me like it wasn't registering. And he just said, well, maybe we got it all. That's what he said. He said, maybe we got it all. And I'm like, what? you just, you know, I haven't had any treatment, right? Like zero treatment. <laughs> and, and it just didn't register. And I kept talking and he, he looked at me again and he said, can you, can you tell me again what you did? And so I walked him through it again and I told him about your podcast and, but I just don't think it registered. And I understand because I don't think that we're taught that it's even possible to cure cancer without having some sort of Western medical intervention. And, you know, as he left the room, I turned to the gal who, who had given me my mammogram and, and she said, I believe in the power of fasting. And she gave me a hug. Mm. Yeah. It was really beautiful. Yeah. No, I remember you telling me about that encounter and you're like, I knew that they were going to be confused. And you're like, he was definitely confused. Like what just happened? So I love that. And it's such a beautiful testament to the work that you did. You know, you did this and, you know, it was not just the water fast. It was all that work that you did. We worked a lot on the diet and, and changing with the supplements and detoxification and all of the work. So I just have to say, I'm so proud to be your doctor. Like, I'm so proud of what you have accomplished and that I love that you have come on here to share with others what's possible because this, these are the stories that we're not told. We're not told that this is possible, but you know, you're an example and you also have changed, right? So even just in it, since the time that we've met, you've radically shifted a lot of areas of your life and you had already done work before then. So <clears throat> I think this is, you know, an example of where change is required and you embrace that. And so I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful to have been on your team and to have witnessed what you've accomplished. Thank you. <laughs> so what? Oh, you know, I just, 
it's something that kept coming up for me here is the lack of connection that we have to not only ourselves, you know, most of us are, do not have that connection, but to the foods we eat, to the water that we drink, you know, we take it for granted, you know, the sunlight, you know, stepping outside and enjoying like a breeze on our face. Like we over time have lost that connection. And I think part of what the gift of this particular diagnosis was, was helping me reconnect with those elements, those aspects that of life that over time you just become so accustomed to that they seem you know, like they're always going to be there. Right. It's kind of, you know, so to cre- be able to create that relationship, that connection again with the foods, with, you know, because it's not just food. It's they were it was an animal. Right. Mm-hmm. It, that and, it, and it's not just water. It's it's life because we're made of water. Mm-hmm. Like when we think about these different things, I think it's really important that 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 aspect of it. I wanted to highlight because I, I just felt like that was such a gift for me is reconnecting with those elements. That is really beautiful. And I, I really think that it is like part of what's making us sick is the disconnection. We're disconnected with ourselves and we're disconnected with nature and what feeds us in all the ways. So that's so beautiful. So Dina, if we have listeners who are attorneys that are looking for a coach or whatever, please tell us where they can find you so that people can find out more about your work because you're doing quite extraordinary work as well. Thank you. So I have a podcast called Be a Better Lawyer, and you can listen to that. And if you go to my website, dinacataldo.com, I always have something there, whether it's a master class or, um, you know, learning how to work with me further, you can, you can learn all of that there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. It's been a privilege to chat with you here. Thank you. Same. Thank you for joining me on Born to Heal. It's been a privilege to share this time with you. And I hope that today's episode has offered you valuable insights on your journey toward optimal health. Please consider subscribing, sharing this podcast with your friends, and leaving us a review. To learn more about how you can work with me, please visit katiedeming.com. You can find additional resources in the episode show notes linked below. And remember to join us next week as we continue to explore more holistic approaches to healing. Until then, this is Dr. Katie Deming reminding you that just like me, you were born to heal.